She is known as Bloody Mary. She's probably known as one of the worst rulers of England. Mary I of England has a very bad reputation and mostly because of her marriage with Philip II of Spain but also because of her persecution and execution of Protestants during her short reign from 1553 to 1558. In this Once Upon a Woman video I would like to reassess her reign. I've had enough of this kind of myth around her being Bloody Mary. I would like to discuss Mary I, the woman behind the Queen, but also, very much so, the Queen, and also the double standards we have for men and women, not just in the 16th century, but obviously here, very much so, in the 16th century. As I've said before, you can't really understand Mary I of England without understanding her years as a princess, and that's why I made a video on that so please check it out before watching this video it will give you more context to understand Mary the first of England the woman behind the Queen now I'm gonna talk about a delicate topic I'm gonna talk about the persecution and execution of heretics and Protestants in Europe in the 16th century I need you to take into account that while we try to understand something a phenomenon it doesn't mean that we justify it but the early modern period was a very violent period and Mary I inherited a country that was also extremely divided but that had suffered in the hands of Henry VIII and of Edward VI. Henry VIII had persecuted heretics, Catholics and Protestants and her brother Edward VI had persecuted Catholics. And we know how important Catholicism was for her. When she became queen in 1553 and re-established Catholicism, she had to erase in her mind heretics and Protestantism. Now, when I say that, it seems like very harsh and very awful. At the same time, I need you to remember that is exactly what any other Catholic monarchs in Europe were doing. She was not more bloody, she was not more awful, she was not more tyrannical. None of this applied at all. If anything, when we look at Mary's reign, yes, she burnt at the stake 300 Protestants over the course of five years. It can be shocking, but when we look at the numbers, we see that there's also a decline. We see that probably if she had lived longer, these numbers would have dropped because Catholicism would have been completely reestablished, and I don't think she would have continued to persecute Protestants. First of all, they would have fled or they would have been dead, right? Fair enough. But at the same time, I'm telling you how important it was for Catholic rulers to do so. And what really annoys me is that, of course, she was in the wrong. You know, when you look about like killing people and everything, it's always wrong. However, what really annoys me is the double standards we have. And that's where I'm going to talk to you about Francis I and Henry II of France and how they treated Protestants and how they were not called bloody Francis or bloody Henry, but were seen as kind of good and benevolent kings. In the reign of Francis I, there was a court that was established for the trial of heretics. So it was a very special court. It was called La Chambre Ardente. We can translate it by the fiery chamber. They were first instituted in the Parliament of Rouen in 1545. The numbers of heretics in prisons in Normandy awaiting trial was so great that the prisons could barely contain them. That's why the special chamber was created and Francis made sure to persecute, prosecute and execute. Protestants. Two years later, Francis I died and Henry II became king. He took the throne and he thought that these chambers were very efficient and continued to use them. He used also the Parlement of Paris and tried to have similar courts everywhere in France. The reputation of this special court was sending to the flame as many as fell into its ends. So basically here, there were so many Protestants burned at the stake during the reigns of Francis I and Henry II. Though Henry II is going to eventually stop this court because it got out of hand and many people were dying, 
he's still not kind of the type of man who was tolerant and he still fought Protestantism as much as he could. And here we have a very strong parallel between Mary I of England and Francis and Henry II of France who are doing the exact same thing and yet they don't have the bad reputation that she had. But now I would like to talk to you more about Mary I herself. Mary I's bad reputation also stems from the fact that she decided to execute her cousin Lady Jane Grey. However, I would like here to really look at what happened and I would like to recommend the magnificent book Crown of Blood by Nicola Tallis. In this book we see that Mary I really tried not to execute her cousin. She takes you in the last chapters of her book where really we see the struggle and how much Mary is not enjoying it. But what I found really fascinating is that at the end, when there's no other way for Mary because she knows that Lady Jane Grey will represent a threat to her, it's not just Lady Jane Grey, it's her father, is the fact that there are some Protestants that are still fighting her. You have to remember that Mary the First had to fight to get her throne. You have to remember that after years of being humiliated, after years of being mistreated at her father's court, she was not that well treated during her brother's reign, but worse than that, they tried to change the line of succession and they tried to remove her birthright. She fought back and she won and she was loved by the people of London. She had the support of the people of London. People wanted to tutor her on the throne. Here she'd been betrayed by her cousin, even though it is important to understand that Lady Jane Grey might have not played that big of a role, she was still, you know, falling into the side that had lost. And while she was in prison, Mary really tried not to execute her, but she felt like she had no other choice. And in this book, Crown of Blood, you really have the struggle and you really have this kind of human side of Mary the First that I need you to really understand. Another important thing that I think is so striking in this book is that Nicola Tallis reveals that Mary the First sent her own chaplain to Jane when she knew that she was going to execute her, to order the execution of her cousin. And because she couldn't save her life, she wanted to save her soul. And why am I telling you this to show you how important Catholicism was for Mary the First. It was not just something that she approached, you know, as lightly. She was a completely devout Catholic and really believed in saving her cousin's soul. So here again, we have a side of her that is completely dismissed where she tried to show mercy. She did show mercy to Elizabeth because everyone wanted to you know, attack Elizabeth when there were like rumours that Elizabeth was behind some plots against her. She obviously sent her to the tower, but she never signed an execution warrant against her sister. And here again, I think that we tend to forget that Mary was very much more compassionate, very much more merciful. These qualities are completely dismissed when we talk about Mary the First of England. And it should not be, because she was not the monster Bloody Mary that has been spread over centuries. That is simply not true. Two other things that I would like to discuss about Mary the First when we reassess her reign but also her personality. I think we tend to forget the speech she gave in 1554. She has just won against a rebellion led by Sir Thomas Wyatt against her marriage to Philip II of Spain. And she said, I am your queen. To whom at my coronation, when I was wedded to the realm and laws of the same, you promised your allegiance and obedience to me. Let's reflect here. Wedded to the realm. Very interesting word because this is something that Elizabeth is going to use sometimes again in her own speeches. But Mary is the first saying that, that she's wedded to the realm of England. She's devoted to be a good ruler for the English people. And I said to you, on the word of a prince, prince here is a neutral term, it's not female or male. So that's very important not to jump on that term. I cannot tell how naturally the mother loves the child, for I was never the mother of any. But certainly, if a prince and governor may as naturally and earnestly love her subjects as the mother does love the child, then assure yourselves that I 
being your lady and mistress, do as earnestly and tenderly love and favour you. This is a brilliant speech. But here again, she's the wife and mother of England, regardless of her own marriage to Philip II of Spain. And I think that is brilliant that she gave that speech, that she should love to her people. This is something that we completely forget when we talk about Mary I, and that is not right. She should completely devotion to England, she should completely devotion to her people. She's talking about motherly love, which Elizabeth is also going to use, because I believe Elizabeth was in the audience and saw what her sister was doing successfully. Now, when we reassess Mary I of England's reign and rule, I also want you to understand how much she suffered. We know that Mary always wanted to get married and to have her own family. We know how important it was as well for her to have her own children, the strong bond she had with her mother, Catherine of Aragon. She had false pregnancies. She barely saw her husband. He pretended to be here to come and then he never did. And she spent month and month being without him. And she imagined that she was pregnant and each time it wasn't. And she probably, you know, had some sort of cancer that made her think that she was pregnant. And I think we tend to forget the impact on her while being on her mental health that all these false pregnancies and this hope of having her own children and securing the Tudor dynasty through her own lineage meant to her and how it impacted her and influenced her. And that is the woman behind the Queen. And that's why I feel so much for Mary, the first of England, and that's why I wish we really stop calling her Bloody Mary. She was everything and anything but bloody. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope that it helped you understand Mary the First of England better. Leave your comments down below if you have any questions and I'll see you next time for another video. Bye!